Hi, I'm Simon K. Jones, and you're listening to the audio version of Tales from the Triverse. Shots Fired, Part 4. Previously, Koth are protesting on the streets of London. The situation could easily get out of hand, and the SDC detectives have been called in to advise. 1971, July. Another day, 24 hours to trudge through one after another, feeling more like twice that. The years weighed heavily on Yannick Clark, manifesting as far more than the sum of his 53 years. He'd become an old person, far earlier than he'd intended. Hell, he'd been old for decades. Failed marriage, failed relationships, failed promotions. There was a time he'd been good at his job, at least, and even enjoyed it, but that was in the past. The SDC had seemed like a good idea at the time, a decade earlier when he'd signed up to the Commissioner's fancy new department. Turned out to be a dead end, like everything else. Three goddamned universes and he couldn't catch a break in any of them. He rifled through papers and folders, shuffling them around on his desk in an attempt to look busy. The problem with life, he'd always thought, is that it just kept on going. Not for the people who loved it, those were the fools you always heard about on the news, getting hit by a bus or dying from cancer or getting into freak kitchen accidents. No, it was people like him that lived forever, blundering along, never having anywhere to go, but somehow unable to just stop. Nothing had changed in the last ten years, other than more wrinkles, less hair, and a couple of new notches on his belt. Cheer up, Clark, came Chuck Rabotti's voice as she sauntered past. It might not happen. He looked up in time to see her wink. That's what I'm afraid of, he muttered. She turned and came back to his desk. Come on, you've got a new partner starting tomorrow, right? What's his name? Callahan, John Callahan. Right, new partner, new start, fresh blood and all that. You never know, he might be a nice guy. Let's hope not, for his sake. Chakraborty rolled her eyes and continued on her way to the corkboard wall at the far end of the office. She had a good rapport with Kaminsky. It reminded him of when he'd just got started on the force. Then again, he was old enough to be her father, so they had about as little in common as was possible. Same with Kaminsky. The new guard coming up, the fresh blood she mentioned. Clark was old news, old school, old techniques. Just old. He was done, but life wasn't done with him yet. He'd had enough, yet there he was, every hour of every day, continuing to exist. Late shift. On duty, all hands. London. 1974, November. The chief constable in charge of policing the riot turned out to not be an idiot. Ian Burke was almost as old school as Clark, though the years had worn on him considerably less harshly. You sure about this? he said, observing the advancing crowd through binoculars. If we don't cut this off now, we might not have a chance later. Clark shook his head. They contacted us about the protest. They've nominated speakers. We've got Ambassador Varco on the line. It's all being done by the book. Burke stepped back onto the elevated guard post. I'm more worried about them setting the book alight and throwing it at us. He spoke into his radio, ordering his officers to hold position, but allow the protest to proceed. If they wanted a fight, they'd fly right at us and do whatever they wanted, Clark said. They've got no reason to walk slowly up the street. They're making a point, not picking a fight. Burke sighed. When the report comes out, this will kick off all over again. If Officer Jones is cleared, there'll be an uproar from every non-human. If he's found guilty of unlawfully firing his weapon, we'll have Earth first, sending out their troops. It'll be ugly either way. You'd think Earth first would be happy with being in government and leave it at that. No comment, Burke said, grimacing. Clark found himself staring at Burke's neck, where his police jacket's high collar rubbed against the skin. It was standard issue, which meant it might slow down someone with a knife, but you may as well be naked if a coth was coming at him. He thought of Burke standing there, still holding the binoculars up, but spurting geezer where his head should be, his face rolling around on the ground in the puddles and London dirt like a child's lost football. His breathing accelerated, his heart thumped harder. It wasn't Burke's face, but Callahan's, and Clark was back on the balcony, the cough having smashed through the window and leapt away. One cough high on a torphine, able to pull a man's head from his body like plucking a turkey. The moment the portals had opened, 
humans had realised their vulnerability. Thousands of years of being the apex predator gone in an instant. At least on Palinor, humans had the potential to wield magic, which somewhat evened the playing field. Underfoot, he could feel the march of hundreds of Koth closing in on Buckingham Palace as they walked the mall. They'd be surrounded within the next ten minutes. There was no reason for Clark to be there, on sight, in the thick of it. He could withdraw to a quieter spot out of the way and still advise over the radio. Forcing his breathing back to a slower pace, he closed his eyes for a few seconds. You right, Clark? It was Holland who had sidled up beside him. Clark expected him to follow with an insult, but it never came. Instead, there was a spark of familiarity. 1972, July. Clark's terraced house was small and plain. He'd never been good at saving, but there didn't seem to be much point in spending his money on furnishings when there was nobody else to appreciate and enjoy them. He sat in the old brown leather armchair, the small television in the corner displaying the news broadcast. The newsreader was talking about the death of DC John Callahan, killed in the line of duty by a rampaging cough. No details had yet been released. Was Zara watching the news, listening to them talk about her fiancé in the past tense? It had been a good year. He should have known it was too good to be true, that putting his faith in Callahan, in the idea of things working out, in the concept of optimism, was a mistake. The metal case sat on the wooden coffee table, its clasp stared up at him. He should have taken early retirement when it came up as an option. That would have spared him all this. He wouldn't have been partnered with Callahan, wouldn't have been there for his death. That would have been easier, but he'd been afraid of it, of having nothing to do, of idling his days away with nothing and no one to show for it. A job at the SDC, at least, gave him a way to spin the hours. Callahan's energy had been infuriating and intoxicating in equal measure. A man so convinced of his ability to affect change that he'd even started to convince Clark. Idiots, both of them. Hope was a trap. It was the trap door above a pit into which he'd now fallen. Reaching out, he released the clasp on the front of the box and lifted the lid. The revolver lay in its packaging, a cardboard box containing bullets beside it. It had always been a possibility. He'd toyed with the idea, never really seriously. Probably should have indulged it decades ago. How much did he have to lose? How many failures did he need to endure before he crossed the threshold? Why was he still bothering? What was the point? There was no going back, no way to fix what had happened. Lingering on would mean having to live with the knowledge, with the guilt, knowing that he should have been the one to go into that apartment, not Callahan. One decision after another, never knowing the consequences until it was too late. The wooden handle of the revolver had a comforting warmth, well worn, smoothed by the hands of countless police officers over the years. The dark silver metal was cool to the touch as he flicked open the cylinder. He could put just one bullet in, let fate and chance make the final decision, but fuck that. He began slotting bullets into each of the six chambers. The SDC didn't have many firing weapons in the locker, but they barely saw any use, so signing this one out hadn't been difficult. This way, it'd be quick, simple, and everybody else could move on with their lives. They wouldn't have to look him across the office and offer him reassurances and platitudes or feel awkward. They wouldn't have to find him a new partner with all the associated administrative faff and stress. It was better this way. He clicked the cylinder shut. The doorbell rang. Sighing, he ignored it. Again, the doorbell rang. Swearing under his breath, he placed the gun back on the table and heaved himself up out of the armchair. No doubt someone else's delivery or a kid kicking a ball over the fence again. Clark opened the front door to discover Detective Frank Holland looking as disgruntled as ever, not the person he'd expected to see. Holland nodded at him. You right, Clark? He looked past Clark through the open living room door. Funeral starts in an hour. Come on, I'll drive you there. The march reached the gates of Buckingham Palace without incident, all the cough milling around the memorial statue, most of them still extending back down the mall. 
A large squad of police in full riot gear waited inside the gates, behind where Clark stood. Having them there was of absolutely no comfort whatsoever. We have a letter to deliver, declared a cough at the front, approaching the gates. Holland smirked. Does he think this is the post office? Shut up, Holland, Clark said. He glanced at Burke, who shrugged. By all means, be my guest, Burke said. It's not like the king's going to make an appearance. Yannick Clark would have to do then. Clark suppressed a smile as he crossed the palace forecourt to meet the Koth representative. It was an especially big and tall Koth, even by Koth standards, which only became apparent as Clark drew near. I'm DCI Clark. We appreciate you conducting your march peacefully. Yes, said the spokesperson. Some of us know how to treat others with respect. Point taken. You have a letter? The Koth pulled a brown envelope from their jacket and held it out. Clark stared at the enormous, clawed fingers, reptilian in texture and appearance, but with opposable thumbs, and shaped like a human's. He reached through the gates with one arm and accepted the letter. If they wanted to, the Koth could slice his arm off with a swipe of that claw. Please deliver it to the Commissioner. We have sent copies to Parliament, to our local MPs and to the newspapers. We have demands relating to assurances over our safety. Your police colleagues are not trusted. You know what happens when the police loses the trust of the community. I'll make sure it reaches him, Clark said. You have another hour until your permit expires. Then you'll need to have your people disperse and return to their homes. The Koth spokesperson looked to one side, as a television news crew filming their exchange. We'll be gone. Our message is delivered. There were shouts, distant and quiet at first, but growing increasingly loud and close. Both Clark and the gathered crowd of Koth looked to the right of the palace, along Constitution Hill to the source of the noise. Clark didn't have a clear view, but the Koth spokesperson was tall enough to see over the heads of their companions. Mm, your Earth-first friends seem to have arrived at last, they said immediately withdrawing to try to calm the other Koth. Shit. Clark had been afraid of this. The threat had always been from the troublemakers on the human end rather than from the Koth contingent. He hurried over to Burke, who was already issuing orders. What's happening? Renter mob just arrived, Burke said. He signalled to his officers, who began moving the riot squad towards the gates. We need to get in between them and the Koth before this explodes. He shouted towards the palace guards. Open the gates! Speaking into his radio, he called for police at the far end of the mall to move to the palace. Clark kept pace with Burke as he headed to the gates. Weren't we watching for this? Of course we were, Burke snapped. But someone must have bust them right in. Probably got a few friendlies on the force to keep quiet until it was too late. Following the riot squad, Clark and Holland stayed at a safe distance, which put them far closer to the cough than the encroaching human mob. The crowd of gathered Koth was surging, shifting, moving itself around to face the new threat. There was no way that a gaggle of Earth-first hooligans could do much serious damage to them, but it would be enough to escalate the situation. That, in turn, would be enough to turn the papers against the Koth, and after everything else, it would be the final nail in the coffin for good relations. Clark could only imagine how it would skew the imminent referendum on portal access. The riot squad were mostly beyond Clark's sight, moving around the Koth to create a barrier and hopefully prevent direct conflict between the two parties. That's when there were more shouts, this time from behind, from the south. Clark and Holland turned to see a second group of humans emerging from the park and from the direction of the river. Ah, oh, this looks like trouble, Holland said. Times like this, I wish we had Golding and his team with us. They got us into this mess in the first place, Clark reminded him. The second group were armed with nail-studded bats, knives, axes, all makeshift and homemade, but nasty enough. Clark and Holland were outside the protection of the palace gates, sandwiched between the new arrivals and the Koth crowd, which was only now becoming aware of the new threat. Go back home, came a shout. Then Clark saw a flash of ignition as something was thrown towards the Koth. A bottle, with fire burning from its neck, spinning end over end. It impacted on the crowd, flames splashing from it in a burst. 
It was close enough for Clark to feel the heat. Holland shouted something, then Clark saw more explosive cocktails arcing through the air. There was a cry of justice from the Earth First attackers, but Clark was occupied with the trajectory of one of the flaming bottles as it spun in a perfect arc towards where he was stood with Holland. There was no time to get clear, not with the inevitable spread of fire. That was it, then. A dark shape moved above Clark, a downward gust of wind knocking his feet out from under him. The shape landed in front of him and Holland, massive, blocking out the sky. It was the Koth spokesperson, their back to Clark, wings extending to full length, looking for all the world like an enormous bat. The bottle impacted against the Koth and fire engulfed them, the heat almost unbearable to Clark. Tendrils of flame licked around the edges of the Koth's body, but their sheer size shielded the two detectives. The air turned orange, and Clark felt the hairs on his arms crinkle like paper thrown into a fire. He shut his eyes momentarily against the blast. When he opened them again, there were patches of fire on the tarmac around them, and the Koth was still aflame. They turned around, wings still outstretched. The Koth's clothes were burning away, revealing their towering, muscular, bulky body. As Clark watched, spikes flicked up along the Koth's arms and legs, and their eyes glowed fiercely, while every curve was flecked with fire. They were an incandescent black phoenix, brighter than the sun. Get to safety, detectives, the Koth said, still on fire. Holland was crouched, open-mouthed, too stunned to say anything. Thank you, was all Clark managed, as they scrabbled away, through the crowds, towards where Kaminsky and Chakraborty were stationed. As he ran from the blossoming violence, Clark felt a flicker of hope. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can get behind-the-scenes notes and all sorts of other bits and pieces over on the newsletter at simonkjones.substack.com. Thanks for listening.